Warriors Don't Cry, Chapter 18, Page 204. We have no choice. We have to take the risk of talking to newspaper people. Who is going to feed us and put a roof over our heads if I don't get my job back? Mother Lois's face was tear-stained, but her expression reflected the determination I heard in her voice. We sat around the big old mahogany table in the dining room discussing a plan to save her job. Those segregationists will stop at nothing to get what they want. Grandma appeared angry and anxious as she spoke. During the last few days of April, Mother Lois had humbled herself to make several trips to North Little Rock School headquarters to plead for her job, but they had refused to reinstate her. On five different occasions, her superiors told her they were taking away her contract because she had allowed me to participate in the integration of Central. Already, Mr. Henson had called about our late house payment on the first mortgage. The bank was calling about the car. Mother didn't want to plead for any more credit at the grocery store. So the cupboards held a sparse supply of staples. The refrigerator shelves were almost bare. Grandma India was preparing more stews and casseroles with less meat and lots of rice and potatoes. She was dividing one chicken so it stretched into three full meals by using the back and wings in her lemon rice soup. She was baking plain white bread instead of buying it at the store. Sitting and wishing never made man great. The good Lord sends the fishing, but we gotta dig the bait. I say we gotta force the hand of those administrators. They're ignoring you. There were five in Grandma's eyes as she spoke. The loss of Mama's teaching position had upset all the members of our family. Thinking about it, talking about it, planning for it had taken up taken us up like an Arkansas tornado that pounded and pounded us into the wind. Now my home life was completely taken over by the same tense fretting and worrying as my school life had been. It had happened without warning. Mother explained how the administrator had called her into her office and told her he had the connection to see that she got offered a job in Oklahoma. Your contract here with us will not be renewed. The job in Oklahoma is your only option, he said. But why? I've done a good job here. There have never been any complaints from parents or from this administration. This is just one of those things that happens, Mrs. Patillo. It has nothing to do with the caliber of your work. It's simply that we've been ordered to hire a different kind of teacher, he paused. Of course, there is one way you can keep your job. Yes, sir. If Melba too were to withdraw from the school, we could talk about renewing your contract this year at quite a handsome salary increase, he said. Mother was certain he was being pressured by his bosses, North Little Rock's all-white school administrators, who were fighting integration in that city. Still, she had not expected such harsh re retaliation as she walked away from his office. She recalled what Link had said. Something bad will happen, something involving the whole family. As we sat mulling over our fate, I realized that the segregationists had taken away the one thing we couldn't do without, Mama's job. If there were anything that could cause me to leave school, it would be to get Mama's job back. Grandma was soft-spoken, calm, but empathetic, as she said. Well, Lois, you've tried every polite and proper way of getting that job back. I think some sort of drastic action is called for. I don't know, Mother pondered the idea in silence. I had watched her expression become a little more drawn with each passing day. We could call some of those reporters. The main goal would be to get a story in the local white papers, Grandma said. I guess we got no choice. I thought about it, prayed about it. Mama finally said, tomorrow morning I'm going to write down a paragraph or two and call some of those newspeople. There was a lot of excitement for the next few days in school as the yearbooks were distributed. Some of our regular ad ad adversaries complained about loud and long about how the inclusion of some of our pictures had tainted their precious yearbook. But as they became preoccupied with exchanging autographs, a few of them led up on chasing and taunting us. We continued to hear snippets of the fancy plans for Central students to have fun during the finals week of the school year, plans that we would only speculate about. Certainly, none of the eight of us received even one social invitation, nor could we have risked attending even if we had. To make matters worse, I did not receive any graduation celebration invitations from my old school. At first, I had deeply resented being left out, especially since all of us were making huge sacrifices that would benefit everyone in the future. But after thinking about it, I realized that sometimes we were excluded not as an act of hostility, but because they had forgotten about us since we weren't visible in their lives anymore. Over the next few days, I was anxious to get the newspaper to see if somebody would print the story about Mama's job loss. I had watched her go through the awkward ordeal phoning newspeople. Three of them listened patiently as she read her two paragraphs explaining the situation. They called back later with questions and one man interviewed her. 
On Wednesday morning, May 7th, I was awakened by the slam at the front door and Mother Lois calling out to us from the living room. It's here. The newspaper did it. They printed the article about my losing my job. CHS crisis costs her job, says North Little Rock Negro teacher, the headline read. The article stated our problem precisely as Mother had told the reporter. The, little, not, the North Little Rock School District had refused to renew her contract to teach 7th grade English because of her participation in the integration issue. Praise the Lord, we got us some power now. Grandma shouted. It was the first time in days I saw hope in everyone's eyes. Hope that we couldn't fight all those high-powered white men who were talking, taking Mama's job away. The phone started to ring. One after another, the calls came. We raced for the telephone, delighted with the people saying they were on our side. Only a few people said negative things, like Mother deserved to lose her job for being too uppity. But some of those who wished us well were people calling from other cities. The wire services had teletyped the story around the country. People from everywhere promised they'd call the administrator's office and say it was an awful thing to take away Mama's job. It had been the best morning in many days. We actually laughed over the breakfast table. That good feeling lingered as I entered the front door of Central and climbed the stairs to my third floor home room. You'd better pack your rags and get on out of here. Your Mama has lost her job. What are you going to do now? The baiting went on for most of the morning. They had all read the newspaper, too. I wondered if I had been one of their parents who caused Mama to lose their job. Just as Link had warned, the segregationists were heating up their campaign to prevent Ernie, who was a senior, from graduating. They were already saying they sure wouldn't be coming back next year because we'd never last through the semester. I could tell that Mrs. Huckabee also see, sensed real trouble, because she summoned us one by one to discuss our problems. Until that time, I had been observing fewer and fewer Arkansas National Guard troops inside school each day. It was said they were mostly not on the school grounds, but on call as the situation warranted. There had been days in late April when no guards were visible to us in the hallways, but lately, as tension increased, we were aware of them in the building. As those days of May brought more and more physical punishment for the first time in our four months, I was assigned a personal bodyguard to follow me from class to class. However, I never really felt protected by the in insolent-looking boyish grown-up who wore the sneer of a brooding Elvis. The soldiers' loyalties were not to us. They made that very clear in their words and deeds. As we faced days of grueling punishment, I was also coping with the fact that despite the newspaper article, we had heard no word from the North Little Rock school administrators about Mama's job. I was bringing sandwiches made of apple butter on bread ends to school for lunch. One of Grandmother's friends had given us a basket of apples, so there was apple strudel, apple pie, apple butter, baked apples, and apple jelly. We haven't exhausted all our blessings. We haven't knocked on the Lord's door the right way, Grandma concluded. So she and Mama decided the next step would be to go to the presiding bishops of our community's churches. One of the most powerful of our people was Bishop O.J. Sherman. He told Mother to go back to the white administrator and say one simple sentence. Bishop Sherman asked me to tell you he would like for me to have my job. Mother did as she was told. The administrator stared down at the papers on his desk, silent, ignoring her for an uncomfortable long moment while he picked the lint off his trouser. Oh, oh, he did, did he? He looked up into my mother's eyes, a slight smile creeping into his face. Mrs. Patillas, you don't like the idea of working in Oklahoma, do you? No, sir, she said, speaking firmly. I read the article about you in the newspaper, and we've gotten a lot of calls. Now you've gone and riled up the bishops from your community. Yes, sir, Mama's tone let him know she meant business. Got anything else in mind? Yes, sir. I've got to do whatever it takes to keep my job because I've got to feed my family. I'm a woman alone. Besides, I've done nothing wrong. I've been a very good teacher all these years. I don't deserve to be treated like this. The administrator dismissed her politely without saying another word. The next day when Mama got, got to school, her boss came to her classroom and congratulated her on her fine teaching abilities. It'll be nice having you back here next year, he said. I assume your accolades will be forthcoming in writing, Mama replied. The next afternoon, she arrived home carrying her contract. She sat down at the kitchen table and handed it to Grandma, who was placing the dinner plates on the table. Tears streamed down Mama's cheeks as she wrung her hands together to stop their shaking. Let's hold hands and pray, Grandma India said. Praise you, Lord. I knew you wouldn't forget us. As I marked the May days off the calendar, I felt as though I were caught up in a whirlwind. Ernie was rehearsing for graduation, at the same time, there was a constant shower of threats about stopping him from graduating, using new tactics with more frequent attacks that involved more people. The segregationists watched and followed us constantly, looking for ways to isolate us. 
You all think you're going to have a graduation, but a funeral is what you're really going to have. No more like eight funerals. The voice was familiar. Of course, it was my persistent attacker, the ever-present Andy, who continued his threats to get me. No matter what he had taken to chasing me from the gymnasium through the dark hallway that connected it to the main building, he suddenly began backing up his threats by waving a bone-handled switchblade knife in the air. My Arkansas National Guard protector calmly looked on as Andy chased me, getting so close to the knife blade that the book I held up to protect me got slashed through the cover. Hey, boy, you could get us in real trouble if you keep that up. You've had your fun. Now get a move on. The guardsman said with a twisted smile, his cold eyes looking at me as though he would much rather had let Andy have his way with me. I stood there trembling, wishing for Danny. My heart was pounding, but I consoled myself with the knowledge that pretty soon I wouldn't have to deal with Andy. Only a few days remained before school would be out. I decided to duck out of my gym class, vowing I would never walk that way again. Central High School Negroes Pass. One on honor roll. Principal Matthew says he'll, he will not reverse grades, but confirms Green will graduate. We ain't gonna let no wear our cap and gown, one voice shouted at me as I walked the hallway to English class. I pushed my way past him, flashed a smile, and a pleasant thank you. At home, the phone calls were coming fast and vicious. We've got a way of getting your you darkies now, for certain. We're offering $10,000 for your head in a platter. I gulped as I replaced the receiver in its cradle. I couldn't help thinking about how that was an awful lot of money. Poor folks might take a notion to collect. they get $10,000 for my head. Did that mean that they'd have to cut it off to collect? I told Grandma India of my fears. Surely you've got something better to do besides speculating about white folks' silliness, she said. I can't help worrying about Ernie. One of those students could be an imposter. Anybody could wear a robe. Imposter, Grandma looked up from her needlework with a question. You know, someone from the KKK who wants to collect that reward money could pretend to be a graduate. I don't think Ernie is in any real danger during graduation because he'll be there among 601 white graduates. Besides, God's watching after Ernie just like he's watching over you. But I tried to continue being in my pity pot. She motioned me to shush my mouth and hold my hands out so she could circle the embroidery thread around them to straighten it out. After a long moment, she said, You're fretting a mighty lot this evening. Hard work is always the cure for worry. So busy yourself doing those dishes and getting ready for your final exams. I had always imagined that my last day of the term at Central High School would be marked by a grand ceremony with a massive choir singing hallelujah or perhaps some wonderful award from my community, a parade maybe. I imagined the roar of helicopters overhead, towing flying banners of congratulations, something, anything. But it was just the same as any other day. Four of us, Thelma, Elizabeth, Jeff, and I, rode home together early that afternoon. We wouldn't be going back to Central High for at least three months. Long spaces of silence punctured our talk about how we thought we did on our exams. It's over, Conrad said, greeting me as I climbed the steps to our front door. You don't have to integrate anymore. Well, praise the Lord, Grandma India said. Her arms were wide open to receive me. You see, you made it. She squeezed me and kissed my cheek. Well, well, young lady, welcome to summer. Mother Lois handed me a large box that I rushed to open. You're very special to have come through all of this. I thought you deserved a special summer outfit. Early on Wednesday morning, I built a fire in the metal trash barrel in the backyard, fueled by my school papers. Grandma had said it would be a healing to write and destroy all the names of people I disliked at Central High. Teachers, students, anyone who I thought had wronged me. It was against the law to burn anything at that time of the year. But she said a ceremony was important in order to have the official opportunity to give that year to God. Grandma India stood silently by my side as I fled the flame and spoke their names and forgave them. After a long moment, she walked over to the water to water her flower bed. The four clocks were blooming purple and red. We stood together for what must have been half an hour with only the sound of the crackling fire and the garden hose. Finally, she said, Later, you'll be grateful for the courage it built inside you and for the blessing it will bring. Grateful, I thought. Never. How could I be grateful for being at Central High? But I knew she was always right. Still, I wondered just how long I would have to wait for that feeling of gratitude to come to me. Even though I had made it through the school year, Ernie still had to survive one final brave act. Graduation. I counted on being with him, on applauding for him over our isolated though well-guarded section of the audience. None of you will be allowed to attend either the graduation commencement or the baccalaureate service. 
Mother Lois announced over dinner. The authorities believe it would not only risk your lives, but also make it more difficult for them to protect Ernie and his family should they have to do so. They've also forbidden any non-white reporters or photographers to attend. But mom, but nothing. This is no time to satisfy a whim and unravel everything you've accomplished. There'll be enough of us, enough of a circus with that, with the soldiers, FBI, city police, and who knows all. The paper says every every policeman not on vacation will be on duty from six o'clock on. Grandma said they wouldn't go to all that trouble and expense unless they expected something to happen. Besides, Mother Lois continued, their best efforts should be directed to protecting Ernie. She's right. I thought to myself it was selfish of me to want to go. I suppose, but what I knew, but but what I knew to be practical advice didn't lessen my disappointment. At not being able to watch Ernie march triumphantly to the stage to receive that diploma, that night I wrote in my diary, Dear God, please walk with Ernie in the graduation line at Central. Let him be safe. Quigley Stadium was where the 101st troops set up their headquarters. It was there on Tuesday evening, May 27th, with 4,500 people looking on, that Ernie received his diploma. I held my breath as I listened to the radio broadcast news of the graduation ceremony at 8.48 p.m., Ernie became the first of our people to graduate from Central High School in all of its 49 years. Chills danced up my spine as I sat in the big green living room chair with Mama and Grandma nearby. It really happened, I whispered. We made it. The audience had been applauding those who previously marched, but when Ernie appeared, they fell silent. What the heck, Mother Lois said? Lots of people in the rest of the world were applauding for Ernie and all of you who made it through this year. Ernie was escorted from the stadium by the police to a waiting taxi in which he, his family, and their guests departed. The newspaper said Ernie's diploma cost taxpayers half a million dollars. Of course, we knew it cost all of us much more than that. It cost us our innocence and a precious year of our teenage lives. The next morning, Link called, sounding as though he would fall apart. He was grieving because Mrs. Healy had died on the day of his graduation. He insisted I come to meet him. When I said I couldn't get away, he called me a thousand times that day, insisting he had to see me or something awful would happen. Late that afternoon, I had no choice but to meet him. He threatened to come right over to my house if I didn't agree. I figured I had to quiet him down or he would explode. He seemed inconsolable and really crazy, so I said we could walk around the block near the Baptist College. It was a safe place for me in my own neighborhood. Besides, when I asked Mother if I could go to the Baptist College library with a friend, I wouldn't be telling a lie, at least not altogether. When I arrived, he was red-faced and teary-eyed, insisting I go with him to the northern town near Harvard University, where he would attend college. I've thought about this a lot. I'm tired of worrying about you. What will you, have, what will you do when I'm gone? I can't leave. I have to stay here and go back to Central, I argued. Everything depends on it. You keep acting this way, girl. You are going to get yourself killed. I told you. There's a price on your head. They have posters all over offering that money. They'll never let you come back next year. Uh, on and on he went, talking loud and frightened to me. To calm him down, I told him I'd think about running away to the north. But when I waved goodbye to him, I knew I would never, ever see him again, although I would remember him forever. By May 29th, the eight of us had flown off to Chicago to receive the Robert S. Abbott Award, conferred by the Chicago Defender newspaper. It was so I was so excited because Minnie Jean joined us there. It was the beginning of a whirlwind tour and another in the series of awards for received we received for our bravery and significant contribution to democracy. In Little Rock we had been and but up north we were heroes and heroines. We were paraded across stages before adoring audiences, chauffeured about in limousines and treated like royalty at luxurious hotels. In New York we had suites at the Stoller Hilton took limos to Sardis, and lunch with the United Nations Secretary General Dag Hamajajold. We hobnobbed backstage with Lena Horne and Ricardo Montalban at their Broadway play, Jamaica. In Washington, we had a private tour of the White House and posed on the steps of the Supreme Court with Thurgood Marshall. In Cleveland, we received the NAACP's highest honor, the Spingarn Medal. We received so many other awards in so many cities that I lost count after a while. The first time I was asked for my autograph, I was astonished. Afterward, I went to my room to practice my special signature. But by late June, even as Minnie Jean and I were whirling around our hotel room, dressing to see Johnny Mathis, a man we thought of as a deity, Little Rock School integration was unraveling. On June 22nd, 
Federal Judge Lemley granted the school board's request for a stay in the integration order for Central High School, delaying it for three and a half years. The NAACP began a round of applause up through the courts, trying to get a seven students back into Central High. Round of appeals up through the courts, trying to get us seven students back into Central High. By September 1958, we had won our court battle. Armed with judgments in our favor, we prepared to re-enter Central High. But Governor Favis had the last word. He closed all of the Little Rocks high schools. So we began the school year waiting for the law of the land to blast Mr. Favis out of his stubborn trench. I couldn't know then that I would spend the entire school year of 1958-1959 in lonely isolation and despair, waiting in vain. We had come back home to Little Rock, back to being called N, by the segregationists and those meddling children, by our own people. Our friends and neighbors resented not only the school closure, but most especially the negative economic impact our presence in the school had had on our community. By that time, segregationists were squeezing the life out of the NAACP and Bates newspaper, the state press. Our people continued to lose their jobs, their businesses, and their homes as pressure was exerted to convince them to talk us into voluntarily withdrawing from Central High. During those lonely days of what would have been my senior year, I waited for legislators and Favis and the NAACP to resolve the entanglement that surrounded Central High's integration. As September days turned to late autumn, my world fell apart with the onset of Grandmother India's leukemia and her death on October 24th. Ultimately, I was alone at home, waiting to restart my life, waiting to live my teenage years. By September 1959, we had waited as long as we could for Favis to open the schools. The unrest in Little Rock and the bounty on our heads had by that time forced two of our seven families to move their homes away from that city forever. NAACP officials sent an announcement to chapters across the country asking for families that would volunteer to give us safe harbor and support us in finishing our education. I was fortunate enough to go to Santa Rosa, California, home of Dr. George McCabe, a San Francisco State University professor and his wife Carol and their four children. They were a family of politically conscious Quakers committed to race, racial equality. When I arrived, I was frightened to see that they were white, but they became the loving, nurturing bridge over which I walked to adulthood. More than their guidance, it was their unconditional love that taught me the true meaning of equality. To this day, I call them mom and pop, and visit to bask in their love and enjoy the privilege of being treated as though I am their daughter. The love of George and Carol McCabe helped me to heal my wounds and inspired me to launch a new life for myself. It was also their voice echoing in the same words of my mother that made me enter and complete college. In fact, George took me to college in January 1960 to register for my first class. Not until September 1960 did the NAACP, with its tenacious legal work, force Central High to open to integration once more. But only two black students were permitted to enter. Carlotta Walls and Jefferson Thomas ultimately became graduates of Central, along with Ernest Green. It would take years of sorting out my Central High experience before the pieces of my life puzzle would come together and I'd make sense of what happened to me. In 1962, when I attended the mostly white San Francisco State University for two years, I found myself living among an enclave of students where I was the only person of color. I was doing it again, integrating, a previously all-white residence house, even though I had other options. I had been taken there as a guest, and someone said they said the only blacks allowed there were the cooks, so of course I made application and donned my warrior garb because it reminded me of the forbidden fences of segregation in Little Rock. One night, a brown-haired soldier wearing olive drab fatigue stepped across the threshold of my suite. His name was John, and he was a blind date for Mary, my roommate. Of course, for just an instant, he reminded me of my 101st garb, same stature, same uniform. When he tried to talk to me that evening, I ignored him. But the next morning, Saturday, he rang our doorbell. When I told him that Mary had already left, John said never mind. He'd really come back to see me. He brought me strawberries in dead of winter and flowers every weekend. Six months later, I had married this bright, kind, green-eyed martial arts expert who said he would protect me forever. Later, I would come to understand that he represented Danny, my 101st guard, Link, my protector, the power of those who held sway over me at Central High, and the safety that my black uncles and fathers could not provide in the South. If you can't beat them, then you're going to join them, my mother said when I nervously announced my wedding from a phone booth in Reno. I hope you've thought this over, young lady. 
It's not the racial differences. It's the philosophical difference that is most important. Seven years later, John and I split up because he had been a farm boy who wanted a wife to putter around the house and have babies. I wanted to be a news reporter. But he had then, by then, shared with me the most wonderful event in my life, the birth of our daughter, Khalil. As I held the cinnamon-colored bundle with auburn hair and doe-like eyes in my arm, I swore she would never have to endure the racial prejudice I endured. I was wrong. But then, that's a story for another book. Until my marriage, I had been hearing from my old friend Link, living in faraway places as he piled up awards and degrees from this country's most prestigious educational institution. He was livid about my marriage, saying I'd all along told him we couldn't date because he was white, and now look what I'd gone and done. I never heard from him again. Still, I think of him as a hero, yet another one of those special gifts from God sent to ferry me over a rough spot in my life's path. Indeed, I followed my dreams, inspired by those journalists I met during the integration. I attended Columbia University School of Journalism and became a news reporter. I always remembered it was the truth told by those reporters who came to Little Rock that kept me alive. Later, as an NBC television reporter covering stories of riots and protests, I would take special care to look into those unexposed corners where otherwise invisible people are forced to hide as their truth is ignored. I look back on my Little Rock integration experience as ultimately a positive force that shaped the course of my life. As Grandma India promised, it taught me to have courage and patience. My Central High School experience also taught me that we are not separate. The effort to separate ourselves, whether by race, creed, color, religion, or status, is as costly to the separator as to those who be separated. When the milk in Oregon is tainted by the radiation eruption of a Soviet nuclear reactor, we are forced to see our independence. When forgotten people feel compelled to riot in Los Angeles, we share their pain through our TV screens, and their ravages impact our emotional and economic health. The task that remains is to cope with our interdependence to see ourselves reflected in every other human being and to respect and honor our differences. Namaste. The God in me sees and honors the God in you.